So today I'm joined by Christian Ferbeau, founder of the Versivio Labs, a venture builder dedicated to fintech startups and the insurtech space as well. Versivio Labs call themselves the digital rocket fueling the insurance sector. Versivio Labs is led by Christian. And the lab has been running for a few years and Christian will tell you more about how long he has been shaping the lab and for it to become one of the most renowned lab here in the United Kingdom and the Emirates, I think soon. So one of the key goals that Christian wants to um, achieve is faster, cheaper, and more accessible access to technology. Today, I want to review Christian's journey as a fintech venture builder and how he made the shift from traditional tech to new tech. Welcome, Christian. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I want to to hear about who is Christian. When did you decide to move in the venture building world? Tell us about, you know, what excites, uh, I mean, what excites you and what brought you from maybe old world to new world today? Okay, so so I, I think in terms of being a venture builder, I've, I've always been interested in, in new things, in startups and in tech. I think for most of my career, I traveled, lived in different countries, and I worked for other entrepreneurs. And that's why I enjoy doing. That's what I'm good at doing. I'm, I'm good at understanding what someone is trying to achieve and to help them do that. So I did that as a, as a job. I did that as a, as a, as a consultant and as a, as a person who are involved in, 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 in a number of different things. And eventually decided that I wanted to uh, turn that into a, a business into a lab. I wanted to uh, create a, an, an ecosystem where, um, where we were able to, to work with um, many entrepreneurs and, and help them execute on um, the great ideas that, um, that they have. Um, so that was the, that, that was the, that was the idea that, that that's how it became um, Vesuvio Labs, a business. It was all about finding uh, great people with great ideas that perhaps do not have the technology uh, expertise to um, execute on those ideas and then see if we could partner with them and create um, uh, great companies together. So we started that about three, you know, company had been running for a while before that, but probably three years ago was when when we, we when you could say we became what we are today that's okay. that's wonderful and how many people do you have on your team today christian uh, i mean we 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 are growing quite a bit i i, I would say we we are some some something around sort of 60 60 65 people at today um i think uh, we're looking at adding about 5 5 people a month um in the next probably year, uh, so so it's it's growing it's growing at a at a good at a good pace. Congratulations! Very pleased for you. Thank so tell you. Tell us tell us a little bit more about your business model. So um, I, I mean, uh, obviously, as a as a venture builder, what what you effectively uh, do is that you take some degree of risk in the projects in the clients that you that you work with um, so that means that someone comes to us very early in their in their journey and they do not necessarily have a, a, a whole lot of um, uh, business there yet um, and certainly they don't necessarily have um, a capital they, they haven't um, been out there raising raising money yet um, so, so what we try to do is get involved in that very, very early stage, um, and we um, invest in those businesses through our work. 
So you could call that sweat equity. So we invest in helping those companies get to that um, stage where they um, have launched their, their first version of their, their platform and starting to generate some, some turnover for their businesses. Um, that's the stage where traditional investors like to, to, to get involved. Um, but there's not a whole lot in that um, phase before that. We, we particularly like to find um, entrepreneurs that are very experienced in their domains. So in insurance and, and, and or, or other aspects of financial services, um, they know something about some part of that value chain. Um, and they know how they want to change that, improve that, disrupt that. And we can then help build the technology infrastructure around that. So that's the, the model. Um, of course, when you're working like us at, on, on 15 projects at the same time, there's also a lot of commonality between them. There's, there are lots of things that each of them will do. And what we try to do is um, develop technology in a way that there is a greater degree of reuse between the different ventures that we have. We work very um, hard on creating a shared a baseline infrastructure that everyone can benefit from. Um, therefore, uh, reducing the risk of getting it wrong and the time to market. So, so the, the, the model is really around that is to say, how do we, how do we create a shared environment or a shared synergetic um, a technology infrastructure that allows us to share some of the learnings and some of the repetitive stuff that everyone have to do while still protecting the things that are making them unique. But most of these startups, I would say, 60, 70, 80 percent even of what they build is not unique at all. It's the same stuff. So they spend an enormous amount of time and money building something that is the same as everyone else, rather than spending their efforts on the thing that actually do make them unique and potentially competitive. So Which that's what we are trying to do. And I think when you talk about being able to industrialize, because that's what you are doing, Christian, industrializing the delivery and the shaping of the core components of, and that is a next, my next question to you, probably an insure tech, you said a fintech uh, venture, you are able to replicate the core components, but then what makes the difference is how you combine those components together. It's a bit like the pizza slices and whether you have pepperoni on it or not. Mm. And then it's about the value proposition, how you serve your customer and deliver against your customer value, right? Am I right, Christian? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I, I, I think that's, the, that's the, um, what we are trying to achieve is to um, uh, allow people to focus more on the toppings to use your analogy. Um, you know, we, we provide the base um, and they decide whether they want to um, put pepperoni or something else on, on, on top. And, and I, think, I think that is um, absolutely the way of uh, the future. We can, see, we can see how much of a competitive advantage it is for our businesses to be part of that um, shared infrastructure. Um, we, we, can, we can clearly see it, you know, us versus traditional venture capital um, that are in theory ecosystem investors, but not really creating any synergies between the companies in their portfolio. How much wasted um, investment um, and uh, it, it happens there. Uh, so, so we, we can absolutely see how that, um, that model is uh, for us superior. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get it right. Um, 
we certainly didn't get everything right um, sort of first attempt. Uh, but I think little by little, we, we, we are starting to create that type of uh, technology um, architecture that allows these companies not just to benefit from a uh, faster time to market, but uh, or, and, and better propositions, but also actually working with each other. We, we are seeing a lot of that happening now that, that because there's a strong technology fit, the companies we have in our portfolio are working, are becoming customers and partners of each other, which is obviously a, a massive um, uh, benefit as well. Yes, you know, some of the startups have accelerated over 100 for the past guess now adding 2020 in the box as well in 2021 over 100 globally and that is where the value comes it's not for the startups to actually stay alone and try to drive their deals as a single organization for the corporate right targeting to incumbent value comes as well when they work closely with one another and you have hit the nail christian around ecosystems well, and, and, and on the ecosystem point, it also, you know, you also have to be quite conscious of what companies you select um, to work with. It, it, it would be natural to pick a lot of companies that look exactly like each other. Um, they don't benefit very much from each other, really. Um, the, the ones that are, that are much better is where there's a, a, a technology fit. But but much more importantly, where they are covering different aspects of different parts of the value chain, because then then suddenly you you are able to launch a business that already have a route to market that already potentially have have customers because other companies you you work with are um, are already a little bit further, and they can actually benefit from this new proposition or this new technology that you're bringing into the ecosystem and 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 again i'm, I'm not claiming that's something we saw a, a whole lot of uh, two years ago but we are absolutely starting to see that now and 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 that's you know incredible because that of course from our point of view just means that ev- you know ev- it's a sort of self um enforcing process right where where we don't have to do that much it's it's sort of more happening between um, the different the different companies we work with and 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 our job is really just to try to keep up and um and and make sure that we don't uh, um you know that we are resourcing things properly that we have um that, that we are researching the different uh, technology solutions and and, 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 and and trying very hard to help them also um, access new markets potentially, which is another um, thing that we spend quite a bit of time on. So how many companies have you helped build, Christian? So at the moment we have, I think we have investments in 11 companies um, we we have a handful more that are not that we don't have so we, where we are not you know uh, owners um, just technology partners. So if I say something round about 15, 15 businesses is probably um, um, the right number. Um, of those fifteen, there will probably be five or six that are that are looking. Uh, sort of very strong for 2022. Um, so, so um, uh, probably probably a third of the companies that we um, are working with um, are, are, are looking like um, pretty strong growth for for 2022. So, so 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 sort of 15 in total out of those, probably 10 we have equity in and probably half of those are um very looking very very busy um for the next year that's wonderful and um that's showing you know it takes times as well to be growth companies it doesn't happen overnight 
often when, you know, I talk to, um, when I talk to university student MBAs, you know, entrepreneurs wanting, you know, people going into an entrepreneurial and innovation uh, degrees who actually want to build their venture, they think, you know, they can become entrepreneurs and founders for sure. You can become that overnight, but it takes time to build growth ventures. It takes years often. So you have to be prepared to actually learn through the journey what that really mean to build a growth it, venture. It's pretty rare, actually, that that some, like any of the ones that are really looking like they are about to take off and some, some, some has. It's pretty rare that they start out like that. You know, they, they, they go through all sorts of ups and downs and twists and uh, disappointments and, you know, uh, arguments with uh, co-founders and investors. And there's all sorts of things um, that, uh, that, that you don't hear about. You, you just read this, this headline that somebody's raised a lot of money um, and, and, and you don't hear or read about the three or four times that they, they made it nearly there and it fell through and there was all sorts of challenges around that. And, and I, I would go so far to, uh, as to say that, that probably the, the most important um, attribute of a, uh, this would be surprising, the most important attribute that I find with these um, entrepreneurs is tenacity and patience. There, there's this idea that, that you should fail fast. No, you should work and work and work until you succeed. And, 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 and it, it, there are some, some people that are willing to, to go through all of that, go through all of that pain uh, to be successful. Um, and and you, don't, you don't read much about that. Um, but but clearly, when you certainly when you look at our uh, group of companies, um, what what do they all have in common? The ones that we we you know we see making it, it's just incredible work ethic, um, tenacity, um, and and believe in themselves, even though they're going to be faced with many many um, rejections and obstacles and 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 difficulty believing in oneself resiliency and being able to adapt regularly is what i hear from your your three pillars actually christian so can i ask you what has been your ups and down what have been your ups and downs building the CVO labs oh i mean we, we we still have ups and downs i mean we we are effectively a, a an a never-ending startup of startups. So clearly, we're going to have a lot of ups and downs. Um, I, I think if you if you look at really back, um, and and uh, I, I've had plenty of ups and downs my, myself pre even setting up this company. But when when you try to set up a business like this. Uh, suggesting that you should be a technology partner for other people, whether that's startups or incumbents. Um, but you have nothing. You have yourself. You have no technology platform. You have no staff, nothing. Uh, that's pretty much uphill, right? So I would, I would say that the first year, um, there, was, there, there were not that many people answering my emails or phone calls or that kind of stuff. So, so it, it took um, quite a long time before I sort of started to get a little bit of, of traction. So there were plenty of downs there. Um, I, I think, again, like, like a lot of people that are trying to set up a business, I, in my family, I had some, there was some, uh, quite serious health issues um, at exactly the wrong time. When you're trying to start a business, you don't have any real resources. Everything hangs off yourself, and then trying to to um, uh, look after other people as well is 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 pretty pretty tough. I had a young family, like two two kids. Um, 
And then finally, when I, I, I thought, okay, we're starting to get it all together, uh, COVID happened. Um, and, and of course, um, with, with um, a, a company that is based on startups and, 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 and most of those startups were in an early stage, um, funding became, you know, literally overnight a problem, right? So because nobody had any access to any, any investors or any, uh, all, all the, the kind of um, business that they were expecting didn't happen. Um, and that was kind of across the board. So, so it became a quite a, quite a tough time uh, in, in, in there. So, so, so plenty of ups and downs. I would say though, um, we chose, um, as in Vesuvio chose, rather than scale down the, the business, that the best option for us was to work harder and be much, much more aggressive. Um, uh, it worked out well for us, but clearly it was not without um, some, some effort. Uh, we, we, we came out of this sort of COVID um, uh, twice the size, a lot more clients, um, obviously still struggling with um, um, cash flow. But that's effectively the thing that we are carrying into 2022 now. And, and um, I'm happy that we, we did it, but it was clearly not without um, some effort. So, so we, we kind of go through a lot of the same thing that our, uh, that our um, uh, ventures go through. Just instead of being three people, we are 50 people. Uh, instead of um, you know, working on two projects, we're working on, 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 on 20. Um, but it's the same kind of um, uh, day or week where you, where you sort of show up on a Monday and there's all sorts of challenges and, uh, and, 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 and you have to work through all of that. I would say we are very close to looking like what could, you could call a, a sort of mature, uh, a bit more mature growth business now, um, but, but it certainly hasn't um arrived in, uh, in 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 two seconds the the final thing to say is the main thing the main part of our business uh funding wise has been organic so it's a very strange idea to try to fund effectively an investment company with income um so so again it's amazing that we we have done so much of it and gotten to where we are but obviously it's not it's not usual to to think that you have to do some find a customer over here to pay you some money so you can invest in in another company a bit like a vc so i think somebody from your team once referred to us as a vc without money um and and um and and I think I think 2022 uh, we would like to um, have more money uh, because I think we can support so many more companies with a bit more capital behind us. So that's the next stage for us. Yeah, um, you know, I remember when we when we met, you actually I was probably one of your target because I received this lovely message from you on LinkedIn, and with uh, those great slides. I said, okay, let's have a chat. That was probably two to three years ago. And look at us. Now we are chatting. We are looking at how we can do things together. And, Mm -hmm. you know, with your comment around, you know, being a VC without money, all these can be sorted, right? It's all about the proposition. It's all about how the growth is shaped strategically and uh, financially, right? And, And then can be turned around. But my belief, as you know, is when you do venture build, it's very important to understand how to found those uh, young ventures, take away the pain from them to actually know how they are going to pay salaries tomorrow. So it's very important to align the two. And as you know, happy to help when we are ready for that. So what are the market trends you're riding on today, Christian? 
Uh, oh my, I mean, there, there are many, right? Uh, I, I think there, there are many different things that are, that are going on. We, you know, if you just kind of rewind a little bit, um, initially, certainly in insurance, it was nearly all personal lines and most of it was um, uh, sort of pure distribution. Uh, what has definitely happened is that there are, what we are seeing is that there are lots of more interesting um, uh, things going on, on in commercial insurance, in um, gig economy, in various uh, places where, where there's a sort of mix between different types of financial services, what you can call embedded finance or, or, or things like this. Uh, so, so definitely quite a bit of that. Um, I also um, expect a lot from sort of infrastructure, supply chain type infrastructure um, that are connecting uh, different players and different propositions, data providers and so on. They need a, an infrastructure to, to talk to. So you could say the equivalent of open banking, but for insurance, I think there's a lot of what potential for that. I and mean, clearly it's an area we would like to be uh, part of. As we has, have not yet um, gotten that involved with, with, with crypto or, or, or blockchain. Um, I, I do think that there will be one or two uh, ventures that we will um, start working with that, that have um, some element of, of, of that. Um, but, but in our case, we, we have been more um, gravitating towards um, higher value added parts of the insurance supply chain, slightly more complex areas um, where there's enormous um, uh, benefits um, in, in, in applying better technology. Uh, so so I, I think this is where we, we definitely see some, some, some exciting stuff happening in the next, um, in the next year. We, we've just seen one of the companies we work with take over one of the sort of wave one um, insure techs. And, and I think, I think the case there was not, it was a bad business, this original one. The problem was that the other companies around it, the potential customers or consumers of this service were not ready. So, so you, have to, you have to be pretty certain that there is, an, no matter how great your idea is, that there is a buyer for it. And, um, and, and, and what we are trying very hard um, is to find the companies where we understand, A, that there is a buyer, and B, that the people that we work with are able to sell to that buyer. Because uh, you need both, right? You, 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 need, you need someone who is able to connect that, uh, bridge that gap um, between, you know, this new world and, and, and then whoever is the customer, consumer of that, uh, of that service. The case study you mentioned is an interesting one because I think we know which case study that is. And... Um, what you find with COVID as well. And some of my startups, some of my top startups as well have suffered during uh, the course of past two years, where when they needed to raise their next series A or B, um, they were not able to do so. And some you know, of the really well-known um, ventures, uh, which uh, were out there, you know, real-time pricing and all those things, um, didn't do as well as we, we wish. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, there's a timing, for sure there's technology, there's a timing, and then being clear around the customer target once is going after, which actually takes me to, you know, what, when you look at, at your world, Christian, what are the key pillar of growth 
you actually talk to your ventures about all the time. We talked about technology, right? We talk about the behavior, resiliency, you know, being uh, forward thinking, and actually one needs to always think laterally, right? To solve some of the biggest problem we are seeing in our industry. You mentioned focusing maybe not on what everybody may be focusing on, you know, moving for more complex side of the insurance value chains. What else? What else should we think about when we look at venture building successfully to build sustainable uh, growth? I, yeah, so, so it, it sounds really kind of, uh, well, A, obvious and, and a bit uh, boring to suggest that something that a lot of people forget is that they have to sell themselves they have to sell their product or service to somebody and and there is that that a tendency uh, certainly among certain um uh, types of entrepreneurs to to want to perfect their product and they just you know there's always something more that you can build Um, and their, their, and their potential customer might ask for this one more feature, one other, you know, bit. And that's the exact thing to avoid, as, as, in, as an, in, an, an investor would say. What you need is people that can form partnerships with other human beings who can, who can um, take their imperfect thing take that to someone and and that doesn't matter if it's a consumer sort of early adopter it's a it's a b2b partner but can take that that idea and that that sort of imperfect um, implementation and work with someone to make it perfect because that that is exactly what some companies have done wrong they've invested millions and millions of pounds and then you you look at the bottom line and there's nothing that that they they literally have 10 grand you know revenue um and that's because they have wasted a lot of time um sitting in their meeting rooms and in their you know uh, offices and not been out there and actually finding out who might be my customer what how, what does it take for me to form a relationship with them. So for me, um, ability to sell is key. Uh, all the other stuff really doesn't matter. Um, you know, you, you have to be able to, to sell uh, what you do, your vision, and, and be able to forge these partnerships with, with people um, outside your office. Um, you can see that a lot of companies, especially very technology-driven businesses, they fail on that. They just never find anyone um, that is willing to make the adjustments that it would require on their side to work into this new fantastic infrastructure or product or platform. So, so uh, that that's what I'm very much looking for it, 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 it you know as a as a pillar is is obviously people that, that 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 understand the domain really well but is also able to go out and and, and sell themselves and sell them their, their, their service and if it's b2b it's much more to do with with partnerships and do 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 they actually find any any kind of um recognition from 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 other sort of incumbents um, that that what the, the sort of journey that they are on is 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 relevant um and and um and and if that's the case it becomes a lot easier to then get the first the first partnership and then the second and um see see them then take off into a, a real uh, real business yeah, um, sure. so for me that's Sales. Sales is most important. What I was thinking as you were talking, actually, Christian, is that when we work, both of us, with technology experts, um, 
sales is not always the strength, right? And even I've been, you know, working in industry now for over 25 years and, you know, I've been business strategist and I've helped major insurance companies with their own growth to market and expansion strategies. When you look at the flip side, which is where I decided to spend my time because I wanted to see tangible execution was technology, you know, predictive analytics was the first things I really focused my attention on 15 years ago. Now, I guess called AI. Um, it's interesting because technologists are great at knowing, knowing the depth of their technology, but then you have to translate it. And it's as if we need uh, business development translators in any startups, because I can see this is often the major problem where the customer proposition is not always well um, um, documented, not very well uh, talked about. And then another thing is when you actually ask for the elevator pitch, you know, the, the small sentence around the one liner, what do you do? Often you end up hearing about the products. And so education around the difference between, you know, how are you going to change the world rather than what do you do? I think a very big question to ask and very different ones as well. A hundred percent. And I, so what, what I want my team to get good at is empathizing with our customers. So that's our, that these are the startups. Our customers are the ventures that we work with. And my team's job is really just to understand what, where they're coming from and what, what they're trying to achieve. And then for us to, to, to do our very best to deliver to that. Now, what we also would like the ventures to do is exactly the same thing um, not sell your product but understand what the problem um, or need is with with this customer you're trying to sell to and and present them with a um, a solution to that don't just go and sell your features right and uh, you know when you're you know, nice uh, platform, figure out what it is that they are trying to achieve um, and then position yourself, your business and your technology in a way that it's going to help them with that. Um, which, which is back to this thing about not trying to perfect your platform because very often what they want is 80% of what you got plus something completely different. So, so what, what you need to, to, to do is to start those conversations a lot earlier and figure out what are those sort of 10 unique things, 10% of unique things that you have to do to address this particular partner or customer segment or whatever it is. Um, so your platform or your, your, your service is able to to really address their needs. Quite often that doesn't happen. Um, it becomes much more of a, a presentation of functionality as opposed to a, a, a focus on, on, on the customer's pain points and, and, and ambition. And I was really, really excited actually the other day from a name drop uh, something. Um, uh, Distribine, one of the companies that we have gone through quite quite a long journey with, because it's quite a technical platform, and 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 it can fall into that kind of um, in, into that gap of, of of perhaps being you know presented overly tech in an in an overly technical way. We we had a um, a an event the other day and, and one of the early customers, a very large customer of, of, uh, of Distribuy presented um, to other potential customers why they like the platform and what it's going to do for their business. And it was really exciting how they were talking about how it was an enabler to their business and what they could do with it as a business. They didn't actually talk about, you know, uploading a spreadsheet and setting up a, you know, uh, some rules. They talked about how it's going to allow them to do more business, process more business faster, 
you know, that type of stuff. And, and that's what we need to, um, to, to encourage with, with, with all our ventures, that, that it, the focus becomes, um, you know, the, the, the technology is sort of less significant in that sense. It's, not, it, it, it's all about how it enables people to uh, do something um, more or better. Yeah. I often said to my ventures, there are three questions you need probably to answer regardless of technology you're implementing. How are you going to help me grow my business so acquire new customers or expand to new markets? How are you going to help me retain the existing portfolio of customers? And then the last one is efficiency. How are you going to help me save cost? Faster, cheaper, better. And mm-hmm. so, you know, on this note, Christian, what are your last words of wisdom? I wanted to ask you so many more questions around sustainability and, you know, how do you select your teams? How you make sure they respond to tomorrow's agenda, right? Which will be sustainability and ESG. But I'm going to to wrap my last question with, what are your last words of wisdom? I'm sure I will need to invite you again. Well, I would I would love to. My my last words of wisdom. So um, I I think you you sort of um, mentioned it yourself that um, you know I don't. So firstly, I, I don't like bi- uh, business is not just about people, right? Business, if you want to be really good at something, you have to implement the right processes to manage those people. And that's something I certainly have learned um, for better or worse, um, that you need to invest um, the time in the tools and the methodologies and all that kind of stuff. And then you add great people. Um, and, and, And you add people where you even if you're not there they try their hardest to make things better um, and why why do you need processes because everyone makes mistakes so so you you need to have a way to obviously monitor that and when when, when things don't particularly go to plan how do we get back to to where we need to be so so don't think that it's all about talent Think that you need to build a, a structure to your business, put the right processes in place for your business, and then um, treat yourself by, by hiring people that are better than yourself than to, in, in, in each of their areas. Then, in a way, you, you, you don't particularly need to be there eventually. Um, so so that, that would be my, my certainly what I have learned um, you need both. Um, there, there's, there, there's, you know, risk in involved in in in, in overemphasizing one one or the other. And 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 once you find yourself in a, in a place where you have the right systems in place, and by that I mean management systems and the right people working in those systems, um, then 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 you can you can sleep well again. <laughs> it uh, reminds me some old words from um, my consulting times. First, focus on process, technology, and people. That was, you know, the way we would put things together. And I'm sure you know which consultancy I'm talking about. And then now moving into a sustainable world, it's planet, people, and profit. Right? You cannot make the world better if you are not making money. Right? It's it's no brainer. So uh, it's finding the, ba- the, the best way combining the two. Now, Christian, I think it's very wise to say that without processes, you can't even know which good technology you can implement to actually optimize and uh, industrialize things and then find the right people who actually align to your culture and your values to actually help you deliver. But always recruit the best people. Definitely smarter people. than Yeah, you. but but I mean, I have so just on, on, on that, we because we are blessed with working with so many entrepreneurs and so many great um, businesses, we also see a lot of situations where some great people have come together. Um, They haven't invested the 
effort in actually figuring out the framework for how they're going to work together. Then it doesn't quite work out. And, um, you know, CTO has left to America. They don't know where the source code is. You know, the other two founders are upset with each other about equity because they, they didn't manage to actually create a vesting schedule. And, and so there's a lot of things uh, that you should put some effort into to thinking about. Even though you have great people, lots of stuff can happen. And, and the structure is really there and the processes and all of that is just really there to support you when things don't go how you expect. And, and, and that's, that's um, yes, great people, absolutely. Um, but what do you do when something happens? And something happens all the time, right? And it literally happens in every, every business that we work with. And, and, and sometimes uh, that will shut down the company. Um, because they can't they can't work out the differences or, or, or something that you know serious has, has happened. In our case as well, I'm not claiming we never make mistakes. Um, we, you know, when we're working with regulated businesses, there's a lot of sensitive stuff going on. You're trying to push these boundaries very very you know fast, but at the same time, there's a lot of regulation that you have to be aware of and. And that, that's a delicate balance to, 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 to strike. And again, you would want to have uh, some tools and some structure, some processes to, to help you navigate that. So you can utilize your people to the best of their ability without necessarily risking the whole, the whole shop in the, in, in, in the process. Christian, I want to thank you very much for your word of wisdom and spending some time with us today. I look forward to sharing your insight with our listeners very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine van der Linden. Thank you. <laughs>